Um, I don't know whether it's the pioneer description or the chief nurse description that freaks me out most. I think it's probably a combination of the two. Um, I, when I was asked to speak this morning, I, um, my immediate first reaction was to say no, um, because I looked at the conference title and I thought, what do I know about AI? I know some stuff. Um, but I am definitely not an expert. Um, I am nowhere near as expert as I suspect many of the people in this room, and I'm probably not going to ask you because that will make me feel worse. Um, but what I am an expert in is healthcare. So I was interested in Ibrahim's description of his eight-year career in healthcare. Mine is nearly 30 years, which is another thing that freaks me out a little bit. Um, I've been a nurse since I was 19. I started my nurse training when I was 19, and before that, I worked as a healthcare assistant, um, and that was my entry route into healthcare. I am definitely an expert in healthcare, and I'm definitely an expert in nursing practice. What I've become over the last 10 or 12 years is an expert in clinical informatics, too. Um, how I ended up here is a little bit of a uh, strange story, although I know it's typical of others. Um, and I will tell you a little bit more about that as I progress through this presentation. Um, but first of all, I want to start with a question to you all. So I've looked at the speaker list for today, and I've looked at the presentation list of what you're going to hear about. I think it's awesome. I think the breadth of uh, it, uh, presentations and speakers on the different topics is great. So I know that I'm going to learn a lot from today. So I just wanted to put this in your minds before I start about what are you hoping to learn today? Because I suspect that many of you come from all kinds of different professional backgrounds. Ibrahim's already talked about and Manpreet talked about who, you know, the, the backgrounds of the people who might be in this room. But I really feel like there is something that all of us can learn from today. I'd just like to ask a question too. How many people in the room have a clinical background of any kind? Okay, that's more than half, I would say. It's probably around half or slightly more than half. Um, that's fabulous. Um, I think it's great that we have so many clinicians in the room here today. Um, but I think it's really important that we also hear Ibrahim's point, which is that we are a really multi-professional team. I feel very lucky as a nurse. Multi-professional working is something I've done throughout the whole of my career. Uh, it's very familiar to me. It's the way that I like to work. I would only ever move into a job where that was what I was doing. Um, but I do want to draw your attention to this question. Think about what it is that you want to learn from today, because that will probably be very different from others in the room. I, um, I don't know whether this is self-indulgent or organisation indulgent. Um, now, I know there are a number of colleagues in the room who work for NHS Digital, so you can switch off for the next few minutes if you like, because I'm guessing that most of you will know this. But what I thought I would do, since I'd been asked to talk here today, on, I guess on behalf of NHS Digital, is to talk to you a little bit more about what it is that we do as an organisation. How many people in the room have heard of NHS Digital? That's a good start. How many people know what it is that NHS Digital does? You? That's it. I'm glad to see the people I work with have put their hands up. <laughs> um, but what I do want to do just for a couple of minutes is talk about what NHS Digital does as an organisation. Who we are. So NHS Digital, we're the national digital and technology delivery partner for the NHS and social care system. I think this is a really important thing to point out, is that we aren't just there for the NHS, um, and it's a really important point to all of us um, who work within the organisation. This is about something that needs to happen across the whole of the system. And when I talk about the whole of the system, I'm very much talking about social care as well as the NHS. But what I'm also talking about is those aligned uh, organisations that provide care, which is not, neither NHS uh, nor social care. Uh, Manpreet's already mentioned that part of my background is outside of the NHS. I was clinical informatics director at Nuffield Health for five years. So I do have some of that experience of working outside of the NHS as well. I think it's really important that we look at who our partners are in these kinds of journeys, because the only way that we're going to be able to make a, the difference at the, at the scale that it needs to be made is by working collaboratively. Um, what we also have expertise in our organisation is the management, obviously, of complex IT systems, but the other really important part about what we do is that final part of that slide. We're the independent safe haven for health and social care data. Um, it's a responsibility that we all take really seriously. Um, some of us will have more involvement in that side of things than others, but it's something we do take very seriously. 
I love this. It's our purpose statement. It's what we do. We are harnessing the power of information and technology to make health and care better. I think it's a fabulous purpose, but I would say that because the reason I came into health and care in the first place was because I wanted to make health and care better. So I think it's great that I now work for an organisation who says that they're using technology and information to do that. So what do we do? Uh, we run the IT infrastructure and services of the health and care system. We design, build and procure new digital systems and services, collect, process, link and disseminate data, develop and disseminate IT and data standards, and I'll come back to that in a second, and we are the cybersecurity partner to the health and social care system. Um, I think that's a lot of things that we do that pe perhaps people aren't always aware of, and I think it's something that hopefully is useful to you to understand what our involvement in those things are. Um, the bottom, right, uh, the bottom uh, central one, we develop and disseminate IT and data standards, including, as many of you will know, uh, we are responsible for the DCB standards around digital clinical safety, the 0129 and 0160, um, which is something that I've used through the latter part of my career and that NHS Digital is responsible for. Colleagues in this room are even more responsible uh, than I um, because we are responsible for both the training um, but also the uh, continuous learning of people who, uh, who are responsible for those standards at local level. Did you know? <laughs> um, some of you will know some of this, but I would imagine that some of you don't, that NHS Digital or its services and products are often your first point of contact with NHS Care. We're responsible for the content and algorithms that run the NHS.UK website, uh, 111 online and the pathways that run 111. Um, and most 999 centres use our content and our algorithms to manage those very, uh, very acute clinical services. Something we, also, um, are take, something we also take very seriously is our role in supporting clinical colleagues as well as patients. So nearly all NHS staff now rely on our services to do their jobs. So there's 1.4 million transactions on the NHS spine every hour, which I think is a pretty amazing uh, number. Um, and if you just think about the amount of data and information that is therefore transacting as part of those interactions, it's huge. Um, I'm not going to dwell on either of the next three slides, but what I do want to do is just talk to you about how we see things in terms of the, the three aspects of what it is that we do. So part of uh, what we do, as I already talked about, is helping the public. I um, mentioned the NHS website. 25 million, over this, these slides are from the end of December uh, last year, uh, but they are still relatively current. Um, 25 million visits a week to the NHS.UK website, uh, making it one of the most interactive websites uh you'll hear me i feel like oh I feel, it feels like my sound my sound's different apologies um over the last two years um things have significantly changed in terms of uh, some of the things that that we are involved with so um, i'm sure most of you've got the nhs app on your on your mobile phones prior to the pandemic um the nhs app was there it was in existence um but it wasn't uh, it wasn't widely used um i would say um, what colleagues have done over the course of the last two years is made sure that that functionality and bits that have been added to it, including the COVID pass, which, let's be honest, is the reason most people downloaded the NHS app so they could go on their holidays, um, we've made sure that that is safe um, for patients to use and the public to use. Um, as I said, we also uh, support the frontline staff. Um, one of the things that we are very proud of is that we have a clinical team that work within NHS Digital, um, a number of them in the room today. Um, they are a multi-professional team. So we have different members of our teams involved in, in, in many of this di these different services. Um, I'm responsible uh, as part of my portfolio for the electronic referral service, ERS, or Choose and Book as it used to be known. Again, huge... Um, product for the NHS and for clinicians and for patients. Now, this is the final part of our, uh, of our work and what it is that we do, enabling care and research through data. Um, it's an incredibly important part of what we do, um, which we take very seriously, but the potential of the amount of data and information that is held within the NHS is huge. Um, so I think it's really important that we collectively, uh, and this is what, sorry, Ooh. 
I think it's really important that we collectively um, take our responsibilities around this use of data very seriously. Um, so um, that's the um, end of the information about NHS Digital. Hopefully it was helpful to you. Um, but I don't want to focus on that. I, I, as Manpreet said in the introduction, I'm going to focus a little bit through this presentation on my journey and how I ended up in, uh, in the role that I'm in now. But what I want to do is focus it around um, how clinicians in particular, obviously that's my background, um, how clinicians are involved in this agenda and how I became involved in it. So I started out my career working in uh, neurosciences. Um, I uh, was a sister in NeuroHDU, um, always worked in Leeds while I was there for 17 years in total. Um, I feel that I've always been the kind of person who was interested in the safety of patients. I um, have always been the person who was interested in learning and continuous improvement. And the reason for that is um, because I think that we are in a situation, I mean, you, you saw it on the videos at the beginning, didn't you? Um, so what, what do patients think? You know, patients think that humans are safer than machines. That's what you heard on the video at the beginning, wasn't it? Do we think that's actually true? So my experience is that clinicians do make errors. All of us who are clinicians in this room know that to be true. But patients probably actually aren't that aware of some of the errors that can happen in their care during the time that they are either in hospital or in care services. So my interest in patient safety has then led to my interest in digital. It's because of that want to improve care for patients that I then realized that digital was probably the only way that we could do this. So this is a photo of me and an, I am an actual nurse. I wore a uniform. Um, it's an old photo. I keep using it because I look 10 years younger. Um, but um, it is a photo of me in front of an electronic whiteboard. My first um, move into digital was when I was working as a nurse educator. Um, and what I, I was embedded within a pharmacy department, so I'm a nurse prescriber um, as part of my uh, previous practice. Um, and I was doing a role working within our medicines and, and pharmacy department. And I was responsible for reviewing um, around 170 medicines administration incidents that happened each month in Leeds Teaching Hospitals. Now, there are some people in the room who might be quite surprised to hear that that's the volume of incidents that occur, but I would suspect that most clinicians in the room won't be surprised to hear that that was the volume of incidents. This is probably about 12 years ago. Um, things have significantly moved forward in that time, but it's where my interest in digital came from. Because I was in a situation where I was, I, I had been working already as a, as a registered nurse for a number of years. I was reviewing these 170 incidents on a monthly basis. And when I looked at them, I was the person who was going to have to then meet with those nurses. So nurses who had administered the wrong medicine to a patient, or who'd given the wrong dose of a patient, uh, wrong dose of a medicine, or had been involved in some or other kind of incident around those medicines. And I used to sit down with them on a one-to-one -one basis and talk them through. We all know about human factors, don't we? And more often than not, it was absolutely not one thing. Um, it was a number of different reasons why they might have made that error. Um, we were in a, uh, I, I worked in an organization that was very forward thinking. It had a, a no blame culture that it truly believed in, which was great. Um, but if you're that nurse who's made that error, it doesn't matter whether anybody else is blaming you or not because you're blaming yourself. Nobody as a clinician wants to make an error. They just don't. However, unfortunately, they work in high pressure situations and they work in complex pathways. Um, and that's just getting more and more complex and difficult. But they work in those situations all of the time, and they're having to make split-second decisions about the care of their patients, and unfortunately, sometimes that leads to error. As I say, I used to sit down with those nurses, and I used to think to myself, this is awful. I used to hate having those conversations because those nurses who had made those errors really didn't want to be in that situation. And I thought to myself, there's got to be a better way. 
there's got to be some way that we can support these nurses that means that they are less likely to make an error. So that's why I got involved in digital. Um, this is quite not mine, it's somebody else's. There's a lot of talk about how you get clinicians engaged with digital and how you get them interested in digital. Um, I think we all are interested in digital. We just perhaps not all of my colleagues realize that there are, they don't realize the potential in digital. Um, and lots of people say, oh, implementation of electronic patient record systems is difficult, and it is. But the reason why it's difficult is because often people are being put into the situation where actually their working life is being made more difficult for them as they see it. So the way to resolve that is, as it says on this slide, make the right thing the easiest thing to do. If you give clinicians the tools that support them in doing their jobs in a, in a way that is easy for them to use, they'll use it. Because they don't want to be, the nurse doesn't want to be the one that's given the wrong medicine to, to the patient. The nurse wants to be in a situation where a computer system supports them to make the right decision, to give the right medicine at the right time, in the right dose, to the right patient. <laughs> i um, just going to talk a little bit more about my journey because um, the first uh, digital role that I did, um, as Manpreet said, was at Leeds Teaching Hospitals. I was one of the first CNIOs in the country, um, Chief Nursing Information Officers, for anybody who's not aware. And I, um, I didn't even really realise what that was at that time. I didn't really realise what being a digital nurse was. Um, but what I did realise was that I'd got a huge amount of accountability because Leeds, te Leeds Teaching Hospitals, as some of you may know, uh, were building, were developing, were implementing a home-built electronic patient record system. Looking back on it now, I think, oh my goodness, how much responsibility did I have there? I really didn't realize at the time. I do now. Um, but what I was responsible for at that time, this is over 10 years ago, was the digital clinical safety of a home-built electronic patient record system that was being used across the whole of Leeds Teaching Hospitals, and then just to top it off became the Leeds Care Record, so it was being used across the whole of the city. I learned fast, shall we say. Um, I can remember doing the digital clinical safety. I was talking to Sebastian earlier about, you know, the original version of the, the digital clinical safety course, the CSO course that many of you will be familiar with. I did it 10 or 12 years ago. Um, it set me up brilliantly for the work that I was doing, but because of the development aspects of what I was doing, it was actually some really scary stuff. But the reason why I kept on doing it was because I could see the very real benefits of it in real time. I can remember sitting in a lecture theatre similar to this one um, with uh, a colleague of mine who I actually now work with at NHS Digital but was working with at Leeds at that time. And he'd come into the organisation uh, from a, a role in, in intensive care. So he was an intensive care nurse who I'd managed to convince to come and work in digital against his better judgment, as he still co constantly tells me. Um, Darren's smiling because he knows who it is. Um, and um, this man who'd got a 20 plus year career in ICU nursing came and worked in digital um, and was in the same situation as me where we were building the CPR. We were kind of muddling our way through it, but we kept going because it was making a real difference. He stood in front of a lecture theatre, similar size to this, um, in front of around 100 more technical IT colleagues, and he told them about some uh, work that we had done to make a VTE flag live in our electronic patient record. So all this was was a flag on our electronic whiteboard that to talked, that notified to everybody whether a patient was at high risk uh, for getting a venous thrombo th thromboembolism. I can never say that. I should just say VTE, shouldn't I? Um, so clots, for anybody who's not clinical, a clot on your lung, in your leg, you know, and there are pa some patients who are at higher risk of that happening to them. And what we did was we added some functionality that, that in the EPR that, um, that flagged it. Um, and it genuinely saved lives because those patients were flagged on an electronic whiteboard as having um, higher risk of VTE. It meant that when then the doctors were looking at what they should prescribe for those patients, the nurses were looking at how they should care for those patients, the pharmacists were reviewing the drug charts of those patients, all of them knew that this patient was in a situation where they were at higher risk of getting a VTE. He told the IT team who'd built that software about the difference that they had made. There were five grown men crying in the audience. 
because the reason why most of those people had come into healthcare IT was because they wanted to make a difference. And they perhaps as technicians or technical people didn't ever really feel that that was what they were doing. But the power of what we can do using the technology and working collaboratively as clinicians with technical and uh, uh, IT colleagues it, it can, can truly save lives. Um, I just want to focus a little bit around patient safety literature um, because patient safety, Ibrahim talked earlier about how he came from different industries where they've been uh, using uh, uh, some of their, uh, well, you know, they've brought some of the tools that they use into healthcare, which is great. Um, but we are already using lots of tools in patient safety um, in the NHS and have been for a number of years. And I think there's a lot of transferable information across these two that we perhaps haven't quite harnessed yet. If you talk to any clinician in the NHS or in the wider healthcare sector and say to them, what's patient safety? They will give you some form of that definition there in response to you. Every one of them will be able to do that. If you ask them what's digital clinical safety, I suspect that a large percentage of them will fall over their tongue and think that they don't know the answer. My reaction to that is to say it's the same thing. If you think about this definition of what patient safety is, digital clinical safety is the same thing. It's just about how we use the technology to maintain the patient's uh, safety and, and make their care safer for them. Um, just, I will share these slides with colleagues afterwards. Um, there may be uh, something of interest in terms of the, uh, the information that's available there around patient safety on the NHS website. Um, the patient safety agenda is very, uh, very big in the NHS. There's lots of people who will describe themselves as clinical governance facilitators or patient safety nurses or any number of different descriptions of that. And this is what they will work on, usually. Um, they will, uh, this is a, a framework that is used um, across the NHS um, around how we manage and how we deal with patient safety. Um, again, there is lots that we can learn from a digital clinical, safe, digital clinical safety perspective from the patient safety literature. Um, the frameworks and the alerts that we see there, um, there are ways that we need to align that with what we're doing within digital. So this is the bit where I um, get technical. No, it's not. Um, I'm, I, my husband thinks it's hilarious that I'm speaking at an AI conference today. Um, I'm not the most technical person in our household, and there's only two of us that live there. Um, so he thinks it's literally hilarious. Um, so the fact that I've got a slide here saying AI, AI lifecycle, I do want to confirm again that I'm not going to talk to you about AI. But what I am going to talk to you about is some principles and some frameworks that I think are important for us all to be aware of. You will have all, I'm sure, seen this before. Anybody in the room who's not seen the AI life cycle before? No? Okay. So you will have seen this. Oh, I feel that this is a, it's a fairly generic li life cycle. So if I were to ask you to look at an audit life cycle, it, it would have some of the same words in it, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, if I were to ask you about, you know, patient safety, how do you make patients safer? Again, it would have some of the same words in it. Project management, again, some of the same words in it. So there's lots of transferable learning across these elements. Um, what I do want to focus on is our responsibility in managing that life cycle. So those of us who are uh, working in this area of healthcare, what's it important for us to be involved in? What's it important for us to know when we're the non-technical experts in healthcare? How can we support this agenda? Leadership and oversight. Um, we need to define the need. It's something that we're not always great at in healthcare. Um, we need to work out what the problem that we're trying to solve is before we jump to solving the problem. One of the things that I see in colleagues sometimes is that they've come up with the solution before they've actually defined the problem. And, and that means that you're probably not going to be successful. Sorry. 
Um, but the other thing that's really important to do is to focus on outcomes. For me, obviously, as a clinician, that's about focusing on patient outcomes, patient benefits. My general feeling is that if you focus on patient outcomes and if you define the problem, you're much more likely to be successful than if you don't do those two things. End-to-end -end oversight is a really important factor, I think. Um, what's really important is that you have that multi-professional team involved at all parts of the end-to-end -end life cycle. I think there's a temptation to hand off different parts of the pathway to different individuals or different teams. And I think it needs that end-to-end -end oversight from people who were there at the beginning in defining the problem, who are also going to see it through to the end point of realizing and achieving the benefits. Now, I would say this because I am one, but I think clinicians are really well placed to be those people who can work across that whole life cycle. Defining the problem, making sure we're, um, uh, we're documenting what the benefits we're looking to achieve are, working through the development and implementation, and then making sure the benefits have been realized. Um, we've heard a little bit about regulation this morning. Um, as, as colleagues have said, that's not something we're going to focus on during the day. Um, but one of the things that is key for us as leaders is to provide that regulatory clarity. So this is within countries, between countries. I would see this as a significant part of the role of those of us who work in national teams. But I would also say that it's also really important for those people working within the local health systems to be that bridge between the national products, we've already talked about the ones that NHS Digital is responsible for, but also understanding how that works across local systems, but also um, working collaboratively with colleagues who work for supplier organisations, for example, um, and as I say, working across countries. There's also a lot that we can learn from others, um, and that's something that I think perhaps we, we've not been as good at as we could have been. Um, and my experience over the last 10 years working in clinical informatics is that we've all, uh, we all have a tendency to try and think that our country is different to other countries and therefore to need to do things differently. And I definitely don't agree that that's always the case. Um, we have some needs ourselves though if we're to do this successfully if we are to drive change through the use of, of AI but also through technology more generally um, it needs to be prioritized and funded appropriately um, and that's something that I still don't see happening um, I think that uh, I perhaps shouldn't say this on camera, should I? Um, I think that the, the political system uh, in, in this country means that we tend to move from one short-term thing to the next short-term thing. Um, it's very difficult for us to focus on the long-term and what it is that we want to do in 10, 20 years into the future, because we're all very focused in terms of funding on what funding we've got at this moment in time and what can we do where can we get quick wins for, for the, the money that we've got? And I think that puts us in a difficult position because it's, not, it's meaning that we're not uh, so readily able to, uh, to, to develop things into the future. Um, one of the other things that I think is a bit of a challenge um, in the NHS is this idea of deployment to development to implementation. Um, as I said before, I think there is a, a, a tendency for us to work in silos so that actually it's not the same people that are involved in the different parts of that. Now, I, for example, have colleagues, one of them in the room, who work for supplier organisations. Um, you know, I, I think it's really important that we work in that collaborative way. It can't be that we as clinicians in the, in the hospitals are working and doing things in a different way than our colleagues who are actually developing the systems in, you know, in a room in Oxford or, or somewhere very far away from where we're, where we're working clinically. I think it's really important that we work collaboratively on that. Um, I think there's also something about this final one which makes people very nervous, which is working across sectors. We're all, you know, we all think the NHS is fine and anything that's outside of the NHS might be a bit dodgy. I, I feel like that and I think many clinicians do feel like that. They feel nervous of, of the unknown. Um, it's human nature, isn't it? But um, we do feel nervous of the unknown and I think there's something about 
learning for clinicians and colleagues about how we make new partnerships, particularly in this field, and supporting clinicians, supporting colleagues locally to understand a bit better why it's important that they're looking at new partnerships. Because if we carry on doing things the way we've always done it, it's a very well-known phrase, isn't it? We'll always get what we always got. If we want to do this differently, we need to think differently and we need to form some new and different partnerships. But we do need standards and regulation in order for us to do that successfully. Um, clear and comprehensive AI standards. Now, who thinks that's easy? Is it? No. Because it's new, isn't it? And that's, you know, the, the challenge around it. Um, it's a challenge and an opportunity. Because actually, we've got lots of people who are really interested in this area of healthcare, and therefore actually this is a really great opportunity. You see, my colleagues hate me because I see all challenges as opportunities. Um, but there is a real opportunity here for us because to, uh, to understand the, you know, getting the right people involved and the amount of people who are interested in this space, I think there's lots we can do. Um, again, coming back to that regulation through the life cycle, it's important that you don't just do this at the beginning or the end, that it's through the whole of the life cycle. And this, for me, is the key one. Um, I haven't mentioned patients really throughout this uh, talk, through this discussion, but I want to come back to that video that we saw at the very beginning of this presentation. I, I, when I watched that video, which I was fortunate enough to get to see at the weekend, I watched that video and I was actually blown away by how knowledgeable and unfearful people were about this. They just think it should happen and we should just get on with it. It's how, you know, I mean, I know it was what, 10, 15 people, but it, you know, I'm sure they were just random people that were found. And actually all of those people felt okay about this, wanted to get involved and felt that it was something that, you know, was really important for us all to be doing. So it is really key that the design is done alongside the people who are going to be using this technology. The other thing that's really important is that final one, and I have mentioned it before, it's about investing in education for citizens, of course, and, and we need to make sure that they are educated to understand what, what is happening in this area, but also for professionals, and I mean the multi-professional team, so that's clinicians as well as colleagues working in the health sector. But we're already doing it, aren't we? So all of us, I, um, I actually haven't got my Apple Watch on today because um, I forgot to plug it in. It's a problem with technology, isn't it? Um, but we are already doing it. You know, all of us in this room, I'm sure, have a extended level of uh, techni technology interest than your average person on the street. But even your average person on the street now understands how technology can help across all of these areas. So keeping well, I, uh, you know, I worked at Nuffield Health, as I say, who not only run hospitals, but also run gyms. They were some really interesting conversations between our senior clinicians and our fitness managers. Um, because there was a really big difference around what people thought that we could do in this area. The, our fitness managers were understandably focused around keeping people well. Our clinicians, our senior clinicians, said that they were also interested in keeping people well. But actually, um, their roles are about treating people when they become unwell. They're not about keeping people well, generally. There are colleagues, though, working within health sector, the wider health sector, who absolutely do have expertise and knowledge in that area that can support this. So again, it comes back to that multi-professional working, making sure that we've got people involved across the whole of the pathway who've got expertise in that part of it in order to make improvements for our citizens. I mean, early detection is, um, I think, is one of the, the key aspects of AI for me. Um, I, uh, I was unsure about whether to tell you a very personal story as part of, uh, of this uh, session this morning. Um, but I am going to tell you it. Um, it's quite a small group, so I feel like I can share with you. The reason why I became a nurse is a, a significant one on a personal level. My mum uh, was ill when I was 18. Uh, she got bowel cancer and she died, um, as did her sister. So her sister died a year after my mum, um, uh, but had actually been diagnosed two years before her. And I look back on that time, and I think, if my mum were alive now and in the same situation, would she have survived? 
I suspect she would have done. Because the advances that have happened in bowel cancer detection and screening over the last, it's a little while ago, since I was 18, obviously, um, it's, you know, 30 years ago, the advances in that area have been so significant that I generally, genuinely think that she would have survived had, we, had she lived now. So it's a very personal story. The reason why I share it with you is because sometimes I think that we... We, we aren't always, particularly as clinicians, as aware of the benefits of this at a very truly individual patient level. And I think it's something that we need to keep in our mind about, you know, that's a very personal story. It's about my family and everything that's happened subsequent to that. But these are very personal stories for the people. And when you think about the difference that can be made through some of the technology that's now available, that's a really powerful benefit that's potentially being achieved. Um, diagnosis is another one where I, um, you know, is another one of the reasons why I ended up in, uh, in digital healthcare. Um, so I was involved in a uh, piece of work which was implementing discharge advice notes across the whole of Leeds Teaching Hospital. So for anybody who's uh, not, uh, not a clinician, by background discharge advice note is the letter that goes from the hospital to the GP at the point that the patient is discharged from hospital. Um, now, um, I, GP colleagues in the room, um, you know, I, we used to get a lot of feedback from them that actually they really weren't interested in the eight pages of information that we used to send to them about exactly what had happened to that patient whilst they were in hospital. I'm not sure why they didn't want to know that information, but they, they didn't. What they wanted was structured information about what had happened to that patient in a summary form so that they could do something with it on an ongoing basis. Um, so we implemented an electronic discharge of advice note, but what we also then discovered was that the volume of information contained within those discharge advice notes was really powerful actually from a diagnosis perspective because if you've got that structured data at that point in time you can use it to predict outcomes for example. Um, so there is already uh, obviously lots of this work happening, lots of benefits that can be achieved. Decision making, Manpreet's already talked about clinical decision support, um, involved in a piece of work with colleagues at the moment around how we can use clinical decision support more, uh, more widely um, and more effectively, crucially, um, because I think there's still some confusion around what is clinical decision support and, and not. Um, I still hear from colleagues who think that, you know, a link to a nice guideline is CDS. All of us in this room know that that's not the case. It's a link to a guideline. And although it's better than having no link to a guideline, it's definitely not clinical decision support. So it's really important for those of us who are experts in this area to be involved in those conversations about how we can make things better. I just wanted to focus in the last few minutes, um, and I feel very, very nervous standing in front of two of my colleagues, three of my colleagues in particular, four of my colleagues. Ah, actually, this is terrible. I probably shouldn't be doing this, should I? Um, so four of my colleagues who lead on our digital clinical safety strategy uh, within NHS Digital. Um, just wanted to focus it on here because uh, on it here because those four people are in this room um, and do have significant expertise in this area about what we're doing centrally around digital clinical safety. Um, I really am um, interested in this quote. The only way the NHS can meet the challenges of rising demand, costs and expectations is to use digital technology to transform itself. There is huge potential to improve productivity, safety, experience and outcomes for patients, people in care and the workforce. That's a lot of content packed into one sentence. But there's a lot in that that is so true and so meaningful that it's the only way that we can transform. We've got to transform within. Nobody's going to come along with billions and billions of pounds and say, here, here's billions of pounds, the NHS is fixed. The only way that we are going to be able to work through, you know, all of us are aware of the, the challenges that are in the NHS at the moment around ambulance waiting times, around uh, delayed discharges, around uh, patients uh, in, in social care. There are so many challenges that the only way that we can uh, transform the NHS is by using digital technology. 
Um, so just wanted to draw your attention to, uh, to the digital clinical safety strategy for anybody who hasn't seen it. Um, document came out uh, late last year um, and is now the implementation of that document is being worked through with expert colleagues who are experts in digital clinical safety, but also have some expertise in uh, obviously in wider clinical practice. Just to loop back to what I said at the beginning, digital clinical safety is just patient safety, and therefore the alignment between those two things is really key. Um, but these are the benefits that we can achieve by working collaboratively. Um, just for one minute at the end, um, are there any other nurses? I know Paul's a nurse, but other nurses, in the, oh my goodness, wow, that's awesome. Um, so um, that's four or five volunteers for this next slide. No, I'm joking. Um, so now this is really self-indulgent um, because um, we are looking at what the future nursing workforce needs to look like. We're taking it really seriously because um, we, uh, obviously the Topol review, which looked at uh, clinical digital workforce as part of a wider review um, in 2018, 2019, um, it didn't really focus on nursing as a workforce, um, and we feel that we really need to do that. Nurses, as everybody in this room, I'm sure, will know, are the biggest workforce group in the, in the health service, health sector. Um, so we want to focus some attention on how we can harness that big group of people to make, make a difference. So there is a piece of work that's just kicked off called the Phillips Ives Review, um, which is using the same methodology as Topol um, and to look at uh, what the digital uh, nursing workforce looks, needs to look like over the next five, 10 or 20 years. The reason for me bringing it here this morning is because uh, there are three expert advisory panels, and one of them, as you can see there, is uh, focusing on genomics, AI, data science, and research. And what this piece of work, this review is going to do is discuss and come up with some recommendations around how nurses can be involved in this area. Now, the fact that there are five of you in this conference room who are nurses demonstrates to me that there is already interest in this area from people who can make a difference. Um, so please, I'd love to talk to all of you afterwards to understand how, how we might get you more involved in this work. Because re what's really important in this work is that we this shouldn't just be about the six of us in this room who are nurses with an interest in this area. It should be about every nurse understanding how they're using personalized healthcare um, in their patients, uh, with their patients who might have breast cancer or, or any other cardiovascular disease or whatever it might be. Um, but all nurses need to have the sort of tool set, the toolkit, um, to be able to ensure that their patients are getting the best care possible. Um, so that's what we're aiming to do, and how do we need to educate those nurses in order to make that happen into the future? I'm going to stop there, because all I can see is that clock at the back. Thank you. Thank you.